welcome back to Breakfast with Bob, the late, late, late night edition. <laughs> We're at the ITU World Championship. Yeah, exactly. We just had the ITU Hall of Fame inductions, and the lovely Emma Snowsill was just inducted. How fun is that to get inducted in the Hall of Fame? Well, you're right. I've, I've never not done a breakfast show. Can we call it, can we call it the late the, night Bob show? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Late night. <gasps> This is yeah, pretty sweet, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, like you said, it's a pretty special evening. Yes. Um, IT Hall of Fame, I mean, it's something, you know, when you enter your career as a, as a young athlete and even to make it onto the ITU stage as, a, you know, competing in a World Cup and, um, you know, to finish your career and still be receiving awards is um, extremely special. So you mentioned during your speech about McKeeley Jones. Here's somebody who your coach basically said, see her, sit on her because she does, she does it right. My, my first World Cup in, in Montreal, um, all I remember it was how cold it was and just seeing McKeeley. Yes. And how cold it was and just seeing McKeeley. Just stay. <laughs> and I'm if like, she's if she's right still there? going, I still go, go, keep going. And um, yeah, it's you're right. You know, that was something that was uh, imparted to me very early on. And I mean, I obviously knew coming into the sport the, the, the rich history of Australian women in triathlon. Yes. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to, you know, I wouldn't say race alongside them, but be in the same race at, at, at some of the tail end of their careers and McKeeley being one of them right. and, um, and one that, you know, my coach said was a, a true professional in every sense of the word, not, the, not only the way she raced right. it, but, you know, out, outside of the sport too. And so um, when it came to race day and her name was on the start list, he basically <laughs> said, you know what, just don't even think about what to do, just follow what she does. Follow and, her. and, you know, I think that was a really important lesson for me. And, um, you know, I, I continued to, to, to look what she did, you know, in all aspects of her career. So when you look at, you made you win the gold medal in 2008, but 2004, did you feel you should have been on the team in 2004? No, you know, it's funny. I was um, actually discussing this last night yeah. in the Olympic Museum, which is very strange to think, actually. In um, Lausanne? It was in Lausanne last night. You were in Lausanne night. last night. <laughs> That's Look right. Look at you, Jet Setter, with the funky, cool, <laughs> lovely, shiny shoes. Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy to think and the, and the timing. But, um, yeah, I, I was uh, having dinner last night, actually, with two other Olympic champions. Yeah. Uh, an American long jumper, um, which you will probably know. He's, he's won a few, you know. Carl Lewis, like no, <laughs> no, next year along, Dwight Phillips. Oh, okay. Right. And yeah. um, and a, a biathlete, a French biathlete, okay. and um, you know, so it was a very you know unique experience as well. But that was something that um, got brought up too, and you know, not making the Athens team. My, I actually said as well that I wasn't ready. You know, you didn't um, think you were ready. No, I, you know, I think um, as much as that I had won that world title. Yeah. Um, and in, and in hindsight, yes, it, it, it certainly fitted the selection criteria and the policy, but it was, wasn't on my radar at that point in time. So it would have been a surprise if you it had been put on the It definitely was. I, I, I honestly, I remember actually Amanda Lullum asking me the question, uh, you know, an Australian journalist saying, you know, well, what do you think about, you know, going to Athens next year? And it, it truly baffled me. It was it like... like on vacation? Yeah. What am I going to do in Athens? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, you know, I was I just won a world title. I, it was totally unexpected yeah. to me. And, um, and the, the thought of making a team was was obviously somewhat very exciting and to be honest in that time I didn't think about it, it wasn't until afterwards that um, I think that I felt a lot more disappointed for McKeeley not being there because yes. I felt um, she won the race a year before on that course yeah and her history her her ability to perform at a big day, day was was proven so you know and that respect I I still took a lot from not making the team not not in a sense that I was bitter but I really went about making sure that if there was a discretionary position available in our team, um, I had to make sure I did everything I could to make it not possible for them not to take me. Exactly. So I really said that, you know, to myself from there on in, in the next four years, I was going to leave no question mark. Um, no that stone unturned. I will be the obvious choice. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, in some way, you know, um, not that it was a failure in, in any part, but sometimes, you know, some of those uh, steep learning curves or mm -hmm. lessons, um, you realize somewhat fuel your desire um, and they actually catapult you to something greater. It turns out to be a positive. Exactly. Because you, you get a sense of, I would like to be an Olympian, now I need to dedicate four years to become an Olympian. Absolutely. Yeah. And so leading into the games, did you feel that, okay, I'm about as fit as I can be? and, and 
going in the race itself how did that play out for you yeah i mean i think um i think the biggest thing was there was a, a, a huge talked up rivalry between vanessa and i yes and and in fact we actually you didn't race friends, right? each other that much right you know she was based in the northern hemisphere i was based in the southern hemisphere and um i i relished every chance i got to race her but um, I think for me, you know, there was a number of things and first and foremost was um, I really probably felt that we'd come so close in, in Sydney and in Athens and yes. like I said before with the history of um, you know, our Australian women, I felt that if, if I was racing for my country uh, in this sport, I really wanted to make sure I gave it my best shot. So that was something that um, I actually took with me into the race, something that fueled me as well. Yes. Um, but on a very personal note, in in terms of my lead up to the race, I wouldn't say I think it was as it was perfect. It was probably as far from perfect in some sense because I, I actually overtrained. Um, probably three weeks out, I realised this, and uh, and my swim coach Dennis Cottrell yes. pulled me out of the pool, which he's never done. Um, he said you need time and, off, and said that I need a couple of days, and. I said, well, I've got an Olympic Games, you know, I've got a, I've got a plan here, you know, what, yeah. what, it, what are you talking about? This wasn't in the equation. And, you know, it was his words to me that were, you won't be on the start line at Olympic Games if you keep going the way you're going. And that was so really profound. At that yeah, point. I, I was over, I just, I had gone over the edge, you know, yeah. I guess I had somewhat had peaked almost just a couple of weeks yeah. too early. And, um, and I'd become so methodical about my sessions and, you know, basically ticking them off and, and how and what I wanted to achieve in each of those sessions, which was a good thing, but, you know, I just somewhat mistimed it you a little bit. And um, it proved to be the biggest blessing in disguise because, you know, to be honest, if you ask me what the key of that race was, I was the most rested and tapered I'd ever been in my whole career. And um, it goes to show you, you know, I think going into a race where you're completely relaxed and completely, um, you know, somewhat, not completely yeah. rested, but, but rested probably more than I would have allowed myself, I actually had, you know, probably the race of my life. And when you win the gold medal, like you said, uh, Australia had not taken a gold medal before for the women. What was, what, what was going through your mind and how did that change your life? Yeah, I think um, I think the emotions were probably took a quite a while to sink in. You know, I think um, it, when you are striving to go to an Olympics and you're striving to take a medal, you actually don't think about what it feels like. You know, it's one thing to imagine, but yeah. you, but the, the the sensory experience it, it ca happens when you go onto the dice and the national anthem. You're at the Olympics. It's almost like you're trying to piece everything together at once, and it doesn't quite happen in that moment right. and, and sometimes I look back at it and and you know I think it has more meaning to me now and it sinks in more now um, afterwards because it just becomes such a relief such a um, you know you, you've somewhat got an adrenaline driving you still through your body and excitement but you haven't really let the you know the actual enormity of what you just achieved sink in just yet. And before you know it, you're starting another season. <laughs> That's also true. And you shove the medal in a sock drawer <laughs> and, you, and you go off and do another. Now, another medal that came out of that games is the guy who you call your husband now, <laughs> right? He was a fellow gold medalist in 2008, Jan Ferdano. Did you know him well before the games? Not at all. No, Not at all. no. We um, met in the medal stand. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Um, <laughs> I remember our first, um, you know, proper conversation, yeah. just sort of one on one, was actually after he won his race, and we were taken to a press conference right. for the new series, the ITU um, World Cups had become right. a series, and. Um, Literally, it was in the two minutes as we were walking in that I sort of was like, so do you know what's going on? He's like, do you know what's going on? And we were put into a press conference. I mean, we'd met once in um, in Richards Bay when they had a World Cup. Yep. And obviously him being uh, spending a lot of time in South Africa, yes. there was a lot of attention on him. But prior to that, it was a bit like Vanessa and I, you know, we really raced in different parts of the world. And, um, you know, it, it took what, obviously quite some years even after the Olympic yes. Games that we uh, eventually met up and um, and now, you know, the 18th of August is uh, very important, obviously, because I won my gold medal, but it's also Jan's birthday. Yes. And then the 19th is, is the day he won. So it's, um you know, those two August days are, are very special days for, for us and our family and something um, we, we make a point to make sure we, you know, we celebrate, we celebrate and, that all the time. Yeah, and enjoy it because I think, um, you know, I think for me now being retired that right. you really stand back and appreciate probably even more what you've done and, and Jan's been very good at even throughout his career but um, it's something we probably really make a point of now and um, and you know just having that moment and you know going back and, and thinking about how special that was and, and how lucky we are.
So when now Jan moved on from the Olympics and is having a great career so far, just won Frankfurt, uh, won the um, 70.3 Worlds, he's, he's on fire. He's going into Kona and him and Sebastian Keenle. Is it How fun has that been or is it nerve-wracking to be that support person rather than the person you know, there's there's something about being between the lines when you're racing you can just race and there's no stress right it's race exactly but as that person behind the scenes is it more stressful you know if you had probably asked me when i was in my career if i could ever support another athlete the way i am now and um i would have said no you no know way. i just yeah, yeah. i i was that person i'm selfish i'm driven i i went about making sure everything was about me and, and really had my blinkers on. Um, but, you know, coming to see Jan, and he's got a slightly different personality, I mean, in the sense that um, he, he can remain a little bit more relaxed at times, I'll, I'll admit at times. But, um, you know, I think for me, um, I've, I've actually started receiving a great deal of um, reward from his success as well. And I think the thing is, I truly understand exactly what he needs because it's what I would want. Exactly, and so I yeah. feel that, you know, um, we make a good team in that uh, that way that we, you know, I, I know he's obviously putting in the physical effort, but I know everything that goes on outside of that um, also requires energy and that can be detrimental to, to training and exactly. racing. And, and I try my very best to, to limit that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think um, he, he also, he knows that there's different times a year that, you know, he knows I take on more of that load than normal. And, and you know, in the off season, he's... Hey back. Yeah, he, he's, he, he goes back laundry. to more relaxed, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll do some laundry, <laughs> go make some meals, go pick up some dinner. He understands that Absolutely. there's a little payback. Absolutely. And I think the only time is um, is race day is the, is the probably, you know, where I, I notice that, you know, I've actually, I you know, when the gun goes, I actually get nervous. Right. Because I'm there for eight hours watching the event and my yeah. adrenaline doesn't get to go down. Whereas exactly. the gun's gone and I know exactly what that feels like. You, you're in, you know, yes. you're in automatic you're in mode. mode. And exactly. You've been, you've been doing let it all, all happen. So, you know, I think, um, I think, you know, this year I've gotten better and better at it as well. And um, I just enjoy watching him race. I enjoy seeing that he's, you know, he's, he's healthy. He's not yes. injured. And um, he's got some mechanical luck on his side. And, and really, that's the most you can ask for when it comes down to race day. Love it. Emma, thanks so much Thank for taking you. time. <laughs> Emma Snowsill, new ITU Hall of Famer, well-deserved again. This is late, 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 late night breakfast with Bob. Our guest has been Emma Snowsill. We are brought to you by Epson. We're airing on triathlete.com. Hold on, everybody. We will be right back.